1 Samuel chapter 10, Israel received their new king. In 1 Samuel chapter 11, we now have a new beginning in the history of Israel. But it doesn't come the way that we might think it would come. We think of kings going into a palace and there reigning from their throne. But Israel had never had a king before. And so at the end of chapter 10, we noted that after Saul was identified and inaugurated as king, he went home. And that's where we find him in chapter 11. There's no royal house, there's no palace, and there's no throne. At the end of chapter 10, he had divided opinion. Verse 27, but the children of Belial said, how shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents. So there's the scene. Saul goes home to his farm in Gibeah and gets on with his life. But then in chapter 11, in God's providence, the Lord provides opportunity to Saul to prove himself in answer to this objection. How shall this man save us? Chapter 11, God says, this is how he will save you. This is how he will save you. At least initially, after this, he'll not do such a, a good job. But at least initially, this is how he will save you. And so in this chapter, we have God's king coming forth to save. Well, I want to open up the text and then we will draw a number of points of application. First of all, consider with me the covenant with the serpent. The covenant with the serpent. When Saul was appointed to be king on the other side of the Jordan in the region of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh and Reuben, Nahash, the king of Ammon, was on the rampage. Now, Nahash's name comes from the word that means snake. It's one of those words that is given to sound like the thing. So the idea of the hissing, the hissing sound, is behind this title, Nahash. And so his word literally means the snake king or the serpent. Well, what is he doing? He's laid siege to Jabesh Gilead and he's set on its destruction. And the people who are holed up in Jabesh Gilead, the Dead Sea Scrolls actually tell us that there are about 7,000 people and they'd already been attacked by uh, Nahash and they're held out in the region of Jabesh Gilead. And they try to cut a deal with the Ammonite king. So you have it there in verse 1. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. In Hebrew it is, Cut a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. That's the, that's the normal way of speaking about making a covenant. God cuts his covenant with people. So they say to Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. Quite something. An Israelite town saying, we will become your servants, O king of Ammon. Well, in verse 2, Nahash states his terms. I will make a covenant with you on this condition, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon Israel. Here's how the deal will go. I will quite literally cut it with you. I'm going to scoop out or gouge out each of your right eyes. A very vital body part in Scripture, much like the right hand. Because you see, if you had your right eye gouged out, you could function as a peaceful farmer, but you would not be able to fight as a man of war. Why? Because your aim would not be very good if you were an archer or if you were a spearman. Furthermore, people would have held a, a, a shield and they would have looked round the side of the shield with the right eye. But guess what? If you had no right eye, you're going to be greatly debilitated when it comes to battle. So this is a way of the king of Ammon saying, here's the deal, total subjugation. I'm going to render you impotent. You will become my slaves. Furthermore, 
he states it. This is going to be a reproach upon all Israel. My terms are your right eye and your reproach. The inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead are going to become one-eyed slaves to the king of Ammon. Well, what are they going to do? It seems that they think their only option is to cast themselves upon the cruel mercy of Nahash. But they ask for seven days respite. Let us call for help. Let us send to the other tribes of Israel to see if someone will arise for our salvation. And the key word there is really found at the end of verse 3. And then, if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. So we're going to send to our brothers with this message, is there anyone who can save us from the king of Ammon? Now that's interesting. Because remember chapter 10, verse 27, how will this man save us? Remember the prediction of Samuel in uh, that, that chapter? Here's the one who's going to save you from your enemies. The inhabitants of Jabesh say, is there anyone to save us? And the Ammonites don't think so. Yeah, go ahead, take your seven days. No problem to us. Put the question out, is there anyone who can save us from the king of Ammon. So we have the covenant with the serpent. Secondly, we have salvation through God's king. 42 miles away to the west, Saul is working upon his farm in Gibeah. It would probably have taken a messenger about two days to travel from Jabesh to Gibeah. And if you think it's going to take him about two days to go back, there's really not much time to spread word around Israel for their answer. The time is short. Saul comes in from the field to find a scene of weeping and lamentation in Gibeah. And he asks, what is it? He's told the, the answer. And the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon Saul so that he rises up with the determination to take action. Verse 6, And the Spirit of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was greatly kindled. But brethren, there's much more going on in this portion that you, than you realize at first. Why was it that the men of Jabesh went to the town of Gilead? Well, could it have been because there was history between these two towns? Remember, this is Israel's first king. All these events are taking place at that period of transition from the judges to the monarchy. And you recall how the book of Judges finishes. Chapter 19 through chapter 21. A Levite goes to where? Gibeah with his concubine. She's raped, mistreated, and left to die. And the Levite takes her body, cuts it up, and sends it to the four corners of Israel. So at the end of the book of Judges, Gibeah is Israel, Sodom. What takes place there is an echo of what happens in Genesis chapter 18. They're behaving like the Sodomites. The tribes respond. They rise up against the town of Gibeah. All that is apart from the inhabitants of one place, and you may have guessed it, Jabesh Gilead. Can you turn, please, to Judges chapter 21? Judges chapter 21. It's inquired who did not go up to help their brethren fight against Gibeah. Verse 8. And they said, What one is there of the tribes of Israel that came not up to Mizpah to the Lord? And behold... There came none to, to the camp from Jabesh Gilead to the assembly. For the people were numbered, and behold, there were none of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead there. And it goes on to uh, show us what happened. They sent their men up. They smote the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead with the sword. There were 400 virgins left. And those 400 virgins were given to the tribe of Benjamin for wives. There's a connection here between these two towns. 
Now the word comes to Israel's king. But I want you to see the context. The word comes to Israel's king in one of the most unlikely places that you could ever imagine Israel's king to come from. Gibeah. If you'd have lived in these days, you may have said this, what good thing could ever come out of Gibeah? That's Israel's Sodom. And the word comes to Gibeah from Jabesh Gilead. Who cares a hoot about Jabesh Gilead? They didn't come up with the rest of the tribes of Israel. They were a town full of rebels. Rebels against our cause. What good thing could ever come from Gibeah? Who cares about Jabesh Gilead? But you see again that God's ways are not our ways. That God is going to get glory unto himself by saving us in and out of the mess of all of our sins. So that we know that it is the Lord as we come to the end of the chapter. The Lord who hath wrought salvation in Israel. So the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Saul. In verse 6, what does he do? He does something very reminiscent of the Levite. He cuts not a person, but he cuts an animal into 12 parts. And he sends it to each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And the challenge is, either you come up now to save Jabesh Gilead, or God's curse is going to fall upon you. Who's going to fight for Jabesh? 330,000 of all Israel respond. They head to Jabesh. They hit the Ammonite forces on a dawn attack, routing the army completely. So the disgrace that Ammon wanted to heap upon Israel has now fallen upon them. Look at the end of verse 11. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together. God's king comes forth to save. The Spirit equips him to deliver Israel from her enemies. The question of chapter 10, verse 27 is answered. How shall this man save us? The question that's put to the tribes of Israel in chapter 11, verse 3. Is there any man to save us? It has now been answered as the salvation of God comes to Israel through her anointed king. The covenant with the serpent, salvation through God's king. Thirdly, the renewal of God's kingdom. The renewal of God's kingdom, this takes place from verse 12 through verse 15. After the Ammonites are routed, everything comes to a natural climax at Gilgal, where two things happen. First of all, Saul's kingship is established, and secondly, God's kingdom is confirmed. You'll see in verse 12 that Saul's kingdom is established. And the people said unto Samuel, Who is he that said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. And Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day, for today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. Where are the men? Where are the opponents to Saul's kingship? Bring them forth that they might die. And Saul says, No. We need to show restraint here. He, he exercises mercy. And yet in the same breath, he attributes the deliverance not to himself, but to God. How does this establish Saul's kingship? Well, this morning we were thinking about God testing his people three days into their wilderness journey. God had a purpose in it. Well, God has identified Saul to be king. There's a question about it. There's no palace. There's no throne. Saul's back on the farm in Gibeah. And God now uses the Ammonite attack to validate Saul's kingship in Israel. It's a test to the nation in providence so that Saul's throne might be established. Well, we saw this morning how the Lord uses trials in his own purpose to that end, to establish us in our Christian life. 
So we've got Saul's kingship established, but then we have God's kingdom confirmed. Saul states it at the end of verse 13. It wasn't him, it was the Lord who wrought the salvation of Israel that day. And then we go on to see it in the ceremonies that are enacted. Because after all the people recognize that Saul is the king, we read in verse 15, And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. That's very interesting. The peace offering was an offering that would reconcile Israel to God. Now you think of everything that's happened. They rebelled against the Lord in asking a king. God gave them a king, and then a section of them rebelled against the king that God had given. God said, you rejected me when you asked for a king, but I give you the king anyway. And there is a sense now at the end of chapter 11 that the people have come to learn that lesson. Even though Saul's kingship is established, God is still king. God is the one who has saved them. Not Saul. The Lord wrought salvation in Israel that day. Something else that adds to the significance of that is where this event took place. In verse 14, Then said Samuel to the people, Come and let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom there. They're not going to renew the, the kingship with Saul. That's right at its very beginning. They're going to renew their covenant under the kingship of God. Now, why do I say that? Well, Gilgal had tremendous significance. If you turn back to, to the book of uh, Joshua, chapter 4, you'll see that the children of Israel crossed the river Jordan right by this place of Gilgal. And before they began their conquest of the land, they had to fix certain things. They renew their covenant with God, and the Lord deals with them. In Joshua chapter 4, and verse 19 to 22. And the people came up out of the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and encamped in Gilgal, in the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones, which they took out of Jordan, did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. That happens at Gilgal. Samuel says, Right, everybody, let's go to Gilgal. Let's renew the kingdom at Gilgal. Where your fathers first set foot in this land. Where your fathers crossed the Jordan. Where they raised the twelve stones. Let's go back to Gilgal. But read on. Look at Joshua chapter 5. Why did Gilgal get its name? Well, because the children of Israel were not circumcised in the wilderness. And so before they begin to take the land, God says you need to circumcise your children. And in verse 9, The Lord said unto Joshua this day, Have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you? Wherefore, the name of of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. The rolling away of the reproach by application of the sign of God's covenant to his people when they enter the land of promise. Samuel says, we're going to Gilgal. We're going there because not only do you need to recognize that Saul is your king, but you need to understand that God is your king. The God who brought you out of Egypt, the God who brought you through the Jordan, the God who gave you this land. Let's go to Gilgal because there you are going to rededicate your allegiance to him. Wonderful that Saul was the instrument of your deliverance, but he was only the instrument. Because at the end of the chapter, the question is not answered. How does this man save us? The question is answered. God is the one who saved us. So we have these three things. The covenant with the serpent. Salvation through God's king. And the renewal of God's kingdom. Three lessons then by way of application. 
First of all, you need to understand the nature of friendship with the world. You need to understand the nature of friendship with the world. Because this chapter really illustrates it for you. Nahash comes up to Jabesh Gilead. He says, they say, make a covenant with us. And he says, okay, my terms are pretty simple. Give me your eye. I want your right eye. In the book of James, we're told about friendship with the world. James chapter 4 and verse 4. And listen to what the Lord says. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world will be an enemy of God. That's true in, in reverse. If you are a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. The reason for that is because the world are enemies of God. So when we read of Nahash in 1 Samuel chapter 11, he points us to another serpent, doesn't he? One that the Bible calls the God of this world. He appears there in Genesis chapter 3 more subtle than any beast of the field that the Lord our God hath made. We find him again in the book of Revelation as a raging dragon seeking to destroy Christ and his church. The God of this world who hates the souls of men, who hates our Lord Jesus Christ, who hates his church and rejects his kingship. What are the terms of his covenant with sinners? Give me your right eye. I'm here to totally subjugate you. I'm here to render you impotent. And I'm here to make you a reproach to the glory of the God that made you. You need to understand that. You need to recognize that the terms of sin, the terms of Satan, and the terms of the world are to have your right eye and to disgrace your Christian testimony in the world. It seems like such a good deal to many. They, they accept the terms. They don't even ask, is there anyone to save us? But brethren, we need eyes to see this, this afternoon that the service of Satan is slavery. Never let it be that in your life you make a covenant with sin or with the world or with the God of this world. I want to press that upon you in a variety of ways this afternoon. Number one, I beg you to remember this when you're tempted. I beg you to remember this when you're tempted. If you're going to do something that you know is sinful, Satan is inviting you to make a covenant of death. And I want you to hear his terms. You're tempted to something in secret. You're going to do that thing. And the word of the Lord says... This is going to blind you. This is going to enslave you. This is going to render you spiritually impotent. A slave to that sin. Brethren, you need to hear this when temptation comes. Oh, it will come smiling. It will come uh, promising to be something altogether different. Like Satan in the garden. Yea, hath God said, I'm your friend. God is not. What are the terms of his covenant? In the garden, it was our everlasting ruin. <coughs> our everlasting ruin. And in all of our temptations to sin, these are the terms. Now I want to apply it to you when you're pressured by your peers. Maybe in college, maybe in work. And some occasion arises... And they're pressing you to do something that you know in your conscience is contrary to God. They're nice people. 
But in those terms, you need to hear the hiss of the serpent. Because the various forms of pressure that will come upon you to turn your back on God and faithfulness to him come in the same terms. <coughs> Give me your eye. Give me your eye. You young people, you're going to face this. You're going to face it in small things and you're going to face it in bigger things. You can change the way you talk when you're with your friends from college. Maybe you speak in a way that you wouldn't speak at home or in church. Well, here's the word's terms. Right at that point, give me your eye. It's not neutral. Give me your eye. You're becoming enslaved to their rule and their idea, not God's, right at that point. And it will move from the smaller thing to the bigger thing, but the principle is the same. Give me your eye. Sin wants to have dominion over you. You must not take sin on its terms. So understand the nature of friendship with the world. The world wants to have us as Christian, as Christians, blinded, impotent slaves. Secondly, see the beauty of Christ's salvation against the brutality of Satan's slavery. See the beauty of Christ's salvation against the brutality of Satan's slavery. Satan comes with his covenant of slavery and death. Give me your right eye. And then in the gospel, Christ comes to us with his covenant of grace and life. So when we look out at the world and we wrestle with sin, maybe we come up with this question that the men of Jabesh Gilead did. Is there anyone who can save us? And in answer to their question, salvation comes in the most unexpected and the most gracious way via his king. And this is the first glimpse that we get of a Messiah in the Old Testament, an anointed king. Very imperfect, though he is. It's the first glimpse that we get of a Messiah in the Old Testament. And what does he do? He comes forth anointed with the Spirit to deliver Israel from the bondage of Ammon. It teaches us a lot. This chapter teaches us that only God can bring salvation into the mess of our sin. You know, when you read Judges chapter 19 through 21, you're thinking, how can the children of Israel ever have descended into this state? And yet, out of that darkness, God brings light. How does he do it? He sends a savior from Gibeah to save the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead. This is the worst event that has happened in the recent history of Israel. And God says, just watch how I magnify my grace. Just watch how I magnify my grace in the midst of it all. And we come to 1 Samuel chapter 11. And when you understand what's going on here in context, you know what you say? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anyone too lost that the Lord can't save him? Has anyone fallen too low? And the text says, no, I save Jabesh like rebels. I convert publicans and sinners. I save the chief of sinners. And I send forth that salvation in my king. That's good news. It's wonderful news to us this afternoon, isn't it? <clears throat> what do we do? We come to him, don't we? We look at Satan and his terms in this covenant of cruelty and death. He says, I want everything. I'm going to take everything from you. Your eye. I'm going to bring you into bondage. I'm going to enslave you. And God comes. And he shouts over the top of that to us in the covenant of grace. Bend your ear to me. I have another covenant to make with you and my king. Even the sure mercies of David. And where Satan takes your eye and everything, I give you life 
and everything freely. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Come by wine and milk without money and without price. Do you see the difference? You strike a covenant with sin and sin says, I'll gouge out your eye. You strike a covenant with Christ and God says, I'm going to give you everything you need. Wine, water, bread, milk, all without money and without price. I'm going to give it to you freely. How does he do it? He sends forth his son, our king, to save. And our Lord Jesus Christ crushes the head of another serpent in order that he might deliver us from the bondage of our sin and of our misery. Oh, that you would hear his offer of salvation to you this afternoon in the most unspeakably gracious of terms. Come to me and take it all freely. Is there anyone who can save us? God says, yes, there's good news. The Spirit of the Lord is upon him. He has been anointed to preach the gospel and to bring good tidings and to heal those who were bound up in the prison of their iniquity. What have we to do? Well, we have to simply believe upon his name. I wonder, would you do that this afternoon? If you're still bound up in a covenant of sin and death, and it's taking everything from you, I wonder, would you by faith simply take God at his word and take the salvation that he's provided in his care? What's the alternative? Well, if you won't have Christ today, you're choosing this other covenant, aren't you? You're saying, no, I would rather have my eye gouged out. I would rather have total subjection to my sin and my misery rather than to humble myself and take a free salvation at the hand of Christ. Well, I leave that choice with you. I urge you to choose Christ and to choose life, but understand what the choice is between this afternoon. It's the covenant of the serpent or the salvation that God has wrought in his king. Which brings us finally to note that this portion gives us a view of salvation and that that view of salvation brings us as Christians to renew our covenant with God And to seek first his kingdom. And that's why everything climaxes naturally at Gilgal. So what is God doing to you and me this afternoon as Christians? In a sense, he's bringing us, isn't he, to our own Gilgal. He's asking us, have you ever been saved graciously by my great anointed king? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know what it is to have been bound in that covenant of sin and death under the subjection of Satan and God freely released you through the power of the gospel? And you say in your heart, yes, I know what it is to have tasted of the freedom of Christ. Well, what you and I have to do today is to own again the king who has saved us. To own again the king who has saved us. And as you do, evaluate just where you are in your life with God. He's bringing you to Gilgal. Maybe he brings you as Israel to Gilgal. And you have rebelled against him. Maybe he brings you backslidden to Gilgal. With your eye being gouged out because you have made a covenant with worldliness. And he wants you to look with your other eye to be reminded of what God has done in his son for your salvation. That you might know that this Christ is able to deliver you again and to restore you. Your king who has come forth to save his people from their sins has crushed the serpent. And you are to remember that. 
that as a Christian, there is no reason whatsoever for you to live under the dominion of your sin. It's not Paul's point in Romans chapter 6. You've died unto sin in Christ. You've risen again unto newness of life in Christ. Sin, therefore, shall not have dominion over you. Its power has been broken. So yes, sin might live in your heart and you struggle with it, the indwelling nature of sin, but sin does not reign any longer in your heart. You need to get to Gilgal. You need to recognize that God sends forth salvation in His Son and that the Lord has wrought such a salvation that there is no reason whatsoever for you or me as a Christian to live under the bondage of our sins. May the Lord give us ears to hear today and give us eyes to see our King riding forth for our salvation. Let's stand for prayer.